one. I might just wait as people sort of get let in. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to our yarning circle tonight about the Northlands project. So before I do that, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country I'm on at the moment, my homelands. I'm on Gunai country. It's on the east coast, southeast coast of Australia uh, in eastern Gippsland. So I'd, I'd like to recognise my ancestors and my elders and my family that are currently living up here. Um, I think to start with, I'd like to introduce our, introduce our speakers, our panel. We've got Claire Land and Lynn Thorpe. So Claire, do you, you want to introduce yourself? Yep. Um, I work at Victoria Uni um, in the um, Mindani Ballot Academic Unit, which is the Indigenous Academic Unit. Um, I'm a non-Aboriginal person and um, I'm involved in this project to, to tell the stories of what um, was a really important campaign in the 1990s in Melbourne. Um, I'm not from the community, but um, uh, my role as sort of a re researcher and to sort of to, to find the resources for the project um, was suggested by Gary Foley, who is a professor in history at Melbourne U uh, Vic Uni, but he's, he's an activist who I met um, as a student unionist in the 90s. Um, I grew up in Canberra, not um, so I didn't wasn't aware of the story as it unfolded in Melbourne in, in the early 90s, but I came here in 97. Um, and yeah, it was through the through being inspired around activism by Foley and then ending up studying history because of him, um, and then doing so sort of ending up doing PhDs at the same time, and then yeah, I, I asked him what I should do next, and he said, "Tell this story because he's he's wanted it to be to be told." So that was the origins of my involvement in this particular story. But um, yeah, I'm um, today I'm speaking from um, Wurundjeri land in in Melbourne, and just wanted to make reference to um, a struggle that's going on at the moment in um, on Jabberwung land. Um, on the Western Highway near Ararat, um, the, tr the, the struggle to save a, a cultural landscape and culturally modified trees. Um, so that's why I've got the, the background. Just want to acknowledge that that present as well. That's happening at the moment. Yeah. Thanks, Claire. I think it's a really relevant issue at the moment, and it probably speaks to this project a little bit about respecting Indigenous ways of being and knowing and doing. So. Um, and we've also got Lynn Thorpe, who I should mention is my mother. And then <laughs> after her, I'll do an introduction of myself. So you're on mute, mum. Lynn Thorpe, I'm um, from my homeland, Yorta Yorta country, um, Yorta Yorta woman, born and bred. Um, got links to other mobs, including Wamba, Wamba, Wurundjeri. Um, so yeah, um, my I'm currently working with um, Claire and um, Alice's on, on the reference group and with this project. Um, I was a career educator um, at that time, 28 years ago. Um, it's pretty, you know, a lifetime ago, but. I think this um, project is really important because it, um, it's relevant to so many families, um, children and um, elders, people um, who live in the, the community of where the, where the, the school was based um, at Preston in Victoria. Um, um, yeah, so I'm really um, happy to be involved in this project especially for it to be um, told um, <clears throat> from the people who were involved at that time, um, representing people who have passed um, during this last 28 years, some people who have passed on. So it's about celebrating their life and their contribution. Um, I work very closely with um, a uh, career educator, um, Deidre Butts, um, who's um, 
going through some health health things at this time. So I hope she's feeling well tonight. Um, but we really um, met so many amazing people on that journey. Uh, we were there for over 26 um, years or so um, working at the school. And um, I think it's a really important story, not only in health, um, but the importance of Aboriginal identity, um, people's knowledge of country and people of where they come from, um, their historical links, and also being able to show or to, to be able to work with uh, across those two systems, the Western system and Aboriginal knowledge systems um, in institutional um, places, not, not only educational places, but health places, um, all, all places really, there's no reason why that can't happen. Um, and I think Northlands is a good case to show why and how we did that. And this is what real got what this project's all about. So, yeah. Thank so I don't know whether I can go further, but throughout um, the time we'll talk a bit more about some of the different aspects. Yeah. And I forgot to introduce myself. So uh, my name is Alistair Thorpe and I'm, so Lynn's my mother and I'm a former student of Northlands. Um, I was there when um, the government uh, closed the school and I was part of the struggle to reopen. Um, so if you don't know the story of Northlands, you'll hear about it tonight. Um, and it was a really good example of community activism um, and a way of, you know, challenging the systems that, um, you know, that dictate to us. So uh, I think you'll get a lot out of this tonight. Um, I'm also, what I'd like to probably say, I'm a black academic. I'm, <laughs> I've probably, my experiences in the Northland story and my mum's influence um, working in education. And I've also got a strong family um, connection to Aboriginal health. So um, my, my family's also been involved in Aboriginal health. So those two sort of areas have combined to sort of force me into academia. Um, and I think one of the things we can do in this space is to really challenge and question some of these things that come up um, and the way that society is. So it's probably why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, I'm also probably should mention it's relevant to everything that we're doing. Um, I'm on the First People's Assembly of Victoria, which is a, is a body that's trying to create a framework, develop a framework for treaty negotiations in Victoria with the state government. So there's a lot of sort of relevant issues that come up in this story that relate to that, you know, issue of human rights uh, and, and around sovereignty and acknowledging traditional owners and history. So I think we'll have a lot of a uh, lot to say about that tonight. Um, so maybe Claire, do you want to, you know, Gary Foley has been integral to developing this project and sort of brought our group back together. Can you sort of give a bit of a background of, of what happened there and how this got started? Yep. So um, Foley is um, is uh, um, a, a very well known um, activist and uh, black power activist, land rights activist, and um, a historian. And he was actually kicked out of school um, at the age of fifteen. So his his um, the experience of, of not having access to education has been very formative for him. His son was enrolled at this school called Northland um, um, in the 90s when the government decided to close it. And, um, and he had experienced the, this notion that there, there was nowhere else for his son to go. His son had, um, had not had any joy at any schools in Sydney where he used to live with his mum. So his mum had sent him yeah. to Melbourne. And there was, there was absolutely nowhere else for him to go. And, and so he was one of the parents who wanted to fight really, really hard to save this particular school. And um, so part of what, um, and yeah, there's so much to say. I usually get, I usually start to rant really fast when I talk about Northland because the more I learn about it, after Foley said to me, look, do this project, um, I just trusted him and from there, I've just learned over time the importance of this story um, and 
yeah, that it's got that's where it's gone from there. But as a historian, um, I guess from from being an activist and, that, and then a historian, um, fully seen um, the way that academia um, gets the story wrong um, when white academics come in and and tell tell histories and um, don't represent it the way it felt like when you were part of it, as as he has been in things like the Aboriginal Embassy and lots of different struggles. So. I think there's a there's a politics of of putting the story on the record before someone else does it and gets it wrong, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's so while he so, wanted it told, there's it's clearly a community story, it's not just. And so, I think that's a good point to sort of share the conversation around the collective group, you know, the the collective drive from Northlands and 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 how that was done and, and the values that were developed through the Northlands project. And that's sort of, we're trying to reinvigorate that now through this research. So mum, do you want to explain the history of Northlands and how it sort of became a school for Aboriginal people to really trust and engage with? Mm, it's a big story. Um, yeah. I think firstly, though, like this is something that I've, I've become more um, more aware of, I guess, um, just looking through all the whole, whole records, um, history of the school itself. And as I um, delve deeper and in, into that, I think it's important to acknowledge, um, you know, this fight is a, it, it was a collaboration between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people yeah. um, based on those same um principles of wanting to create um of what people you know people might regard as a quality education um but that is re um, relevant or you know that engages um people from so many different cultural backgrounds but was spe especially um good for aboriginal people um for a number of reasons but before i go on with that i just would like to acknowledge that the school itself i think it was 1960 that the school was um, established. And from the very start, uh, that school was very community oriented. Um, the local community had a lot of say in the school. So, um, you know, and the principals, um, especially the last principal that I was lucky enough to meet, who was still working, um, came back to work there for a period when um, Deidre and I were there, um, Bill Maxwell. Um, it was like, he was a man on, um, Pretty extraordinary vision really when you think about it um, this is going back 30 almost 30 years ago and um, he had a drive to create this environment I think for basically grassroots community and um, that was everybody you know working class um, different people who came there and I think that that was and, and also one of the other things in the school was that it had um, that I'd always felt it had a very, um, it had a creative, a, a core of creative, because um, it got a year 13 there. So visual arts, um, the drama, dance, um, music. And um, it was a very progressive school over the time, developing different music programs that other schools hadn't. Um, but I think from the very foundation, it was a school built for community um, and people, local people to be a part of that. So, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge that. And I've, we've been able to build on that. And um, with people like Jill Morgan, um, who was uh, Multicultural Arts Victoria for many years. Um, we've, um, Deidre and I and others, uh, other, a lot of other regional people and have worked with Jill um, even since I've moved away from Melbourne, you know, moved back home. Um, I've been back in um, home in, for 10 years. Uh, but we've all continued to work because we have, uh, I think, the same passion. Um, and we've all experienced um, what we've, um, you know, what we've experienced and seen for our own, um, you know, for our own self and experience and with families and children, um, how important this model of education is. Um, so it was really... Gross, yeah. It's amazing, you know, like, because it had, um, um, there was different aspects, you know, um, there, there was um, the um, special class, the, sorry, I'm 
Can't so it was a forward thinking, progressive yeah, very. community, wasn't it? And a very inclusive. Like, there were so many elements to it that was extraordinary, you know, compared to our other schools, just wasn't your everyday normal school. Um, but we were able to embed Aboriginal perspectives um, through, um, I think we, we, and it was very strategic as well. You know, we worked with um, like-minded people um, like Jill and there was other people in the school um, that we worked with specifically to um, embed Aboriginal perspectives into the um, curriculum, um, so but also different activities and um, working with Aboriginal artists, non-Aboriginal artists, a whole range of people, yeah. um, you know, with similar goals and similar passion, um, visions, really. So um, when it was... Culture was at the heart. Culture was a very strong... Um, that was really at the heart of it for Aboriginal people. That was one of the things that we really try to emphasise or, um, you know, where, where that was like lacking or whether that was, um, it doesn't matter what experience or background the kids came from. Um, it was for non-Aboriginal kids to appreciate and value that um, cultural um, knowledge, um, heritage, history, all of those things. Um, so but, a real sense of community ownership. Exactly. Um, it was like a family. Um, I don't think I'm, you know, it was pretty, like even today when there's people I haven't seen for many years, yeah. um, you know, like some of the teachers we've been speaking with, it's amazing how quickly, um, it doesn't feel like it's been years since we've seen each other. Um, so and it, yeah. Because I'm trying to, because you know what my mind's like, I start going... Yeah, and so that was a good summary of what Northlands represented. Yeah. Can you tell me what happened? Like, what was the reaction when it got closed by the government? Because I, I think it's good to, so you, people have a sense of the, the journey that Northlands went through. It was, I think it was really not surprising in some ways because, but shocked at the same time. Um, you know, families and kids, like the kids were running around. I, I was at, actually out at Deacon when um, Deidre rang me up. I was out there because um, I was um, studying, te doing teacher training. And um, she's the one who actually, anyway, that's another story. But she um, rang me and I, like, it was just it was surreal, really. And, you know, kids were really genuinely concerned and worried, you know, what's going to happen? Um, and good. You know, the families getting involved, um, you know, like the, the that big assembly, it was just packed out. And, but it was like, like we were all on the same page. Yeah. You know, every so, person there was, we're all, you know, from little kids to elders in the families, yeah. people in the community. So it's probably good to, you know, acknowledge the way families were part of the school community because... Yeah. It wasn't just the kids that were in school. It was their siblings. It was their younger kids that were part of the family. It was yeah. parents. It was aunties and uncles. So yeah. that real sense of community was a real tangible thing. That's right. I mean, they, even before we started working there, like um, a lot of people, Aboriginal people, um, people in your family networks and ours, um, and people we know went to school there because that's the area they lived. So there's a lot of people who already have those relationships in that. But so that really, really grew, um, really. Um, as when the school, sorry, I didn't want to. When the school shut down mm. and stopped all of that, um, and, and so there was a two-year struggle or three-year struggle with the in the courts, and that's yeah. when a lot of the political activism happened. And we had a lot of parents that were engaged in that, and there was a lot of... So, can you explain the rebel school just so that people get a, so we can just take people along the journey about the different there's probably three yeah, identities um, that the school had yeah so my i i wasn't at the rebel school heaps um but i my role was more um involved with the meetings and 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 on that side of things you know working out what are you know what are the our strategies what are we going to do next in that line. So Deidre really was a key person. She was the principal of the Rebel School. Um, people, um, people like Peter Embleton, he was her mainstay um, as voluntary teachers. Um, 
And um, I think the rebel school was a place where it was like a safe place um, because kids were being, some kids were really being treated very badly at other schools. There was examples of kids mm. um, just being um, victimized. Is that the right word, victimized? Um, and just, I couldn't believe some of the things that were being said, you know, don't come here expecting you to be treated um, special or anything different than anyone else. Or even, you know, some things went really, um, there was really one, I don't know whether I should mention it or not, you know, one young girl um, in terms of, um, um, you know, like one of the teachers said, well, why don't you just go hang yourself on a trance? You know, like that's that was just outrageous. I just couldn't believe it. So that was at another school that they tried to yeah, go. Yeah, that the kids were trying, you know, trying other schools. Um, and there was a lot of, I think, there was a lot of, experienced a lot of racism. Um, um, and I, I guess the rebel school was really a place, it wasn't encouraged kids to go there, but it was a place, um, a, a safe place for pe kids to go. And if, because... Um, so, I didn't really want my son, my son, to go and experience this in these other schools, you know, and I'm, and and there were other people who were the same, you know. Why would you put your kids through that, you know, when you already know, um, especially Aboriginal kids? I think Aboriginal kids really were the probably the ones um, that really, and some didn't even go to school, you know, like because you feel um, they're made feel worthless. And I think that's just that systematic thing, you know, because um, Northlands, um, Preston East Tech Northlands Secondary College was a very special place. And um, it was more than just a school, really. And, um, you know, we knew, and even now, like I talk about it often to people up here at home um, and use those examples still today because I'm, I know from experience that it works and so do a lot of other people. Um, the stuff that we were doing, how we were working. Um, you know, I think Foley talks about, um, I don't know if it's in this film, but about talking about Northlands as a microcosm of what Australia could be. And mm. I think, you know, that's really what we were aiming for, um, a place where everybody could be um, respected. Um, and, you know, until Aboriginal people are given the, the respect and um, all the things that have been done generation after generation, you know, I just... It was a real symbol, wasn't it? Do. For the community to shut, you know, the, the way it was just shut down so easily overnight. And I think that really symbolized the respect that we felt our community had was, yep. there was no respect. And I think when we built up that school environment and, and the kids were part of that along with the teachers, you know, we had ownership over that school. Yeah. So I think having it taken away like that, it really gave, you know, we were educated overnight about the system. So. But that happens, you know, you can relate that to so many things. Mm. Um, things being ripped and things that are working well, that's just ripped out of, out from under, um, well, it didn't no. feel like we thought it, you know, what we thought, because we were really, it was really starting to build up um, and very, mm. um, you know, we were building up a large um, number of kids at higher levels. You know, there was a growing number um, of kids going, reaching year 12, our, our Koori kids, our original mm. kids. And that was one of our goals, you know, to try and break that cycle of kids um, leaving school at 15, um, the beauty of the arts um, and the interconnection with um, culture and identity um, is very strong, um, you know, for people to be able to understand and see, you know, those natural gifts or qualities that they have that ordinary schools don't necessarily bring out. And I think that was um, what was special about Northlands and that culture actually built up into the physical space on I mean, you know these this physical environment of the school um because of all that energy there um anyways like well i, I think it, that's I hope a, it makes sense what i've been talking about but yeah, I think you've given us a good you know um background of the story and and then 
probably just a is that the school ended up getting reopened. We we yeah. won our battle, but mm -hmm. then subsequently the school's now in a different form. But I, I might hand it over to Claire, and she might just tell us what's happening with the project now, and then she can introduce a film if she wants to do that. Yeah. So in a tick, we're going to show you um, uh, just a little tiny. Um, film composed of archival footage. We've got a huge amount of archives that, from this struggle. It was all over the newspapers for years and the, the media and, and all the media teachers at the school filmed everything and the kids had cameras running around filming well things. Done. So there's an incredible um, archival trove around this, this story. Um, but um, the idea for the, the project as it was in Foley's mind was that um, he wanted it to be a musical. Um, so that was always really inspiring. He's got a, a background as, a, as an actor. Uh, all I can do is write. So that was freaky but exciting. Um, but the idea of it being a performance um, was very much tied into the, the strengths of the school in performing arts. Part and of how the that, ability, wasn't it? Yeah. So, so as um, like the first year, and a half of the project was probably one by one, particularly Lynn, um, calling and making contact with as many people as, as we could um, um, to re-establish contact with everyone and be able to let people know that there's something happening. Do they want to be involved? Um, do they want to just be kept up to date? Um, and after some time, um, we um, hooked up with... Um, another former drama teacher from the school to um, support a range of community members to author their own story, a digital story. Um, so what's happening next year is a whole range of exciting things. There's going to be a gathering, an exhibition, a, a, a cabaret, <laughs> and and <laughs> it's a little bit overwhelming, but it's, it's exciting at the same time. So and that the history book will probably come later. Um, um, we've got access to, through freedom of information, got access to the state side of the story um, and how they fought for two and a half years, all the money they spent, the lawyers they spent um, fighting against the children. Um, and yeah, so there's, it's such a big story and multifaceted. So there's, um, there's a number of different aspects to how we're telling it. Yeah. And, and it probably, if, I encourage people, if you go out and find any, you know, you can look it up on Google, I'm sure you could find old articles or, or any information about the story, um, just to yeah, fill in some of yep. the gaps. Claire, you've got to... Yeah, just one other thing to point out is that um, in the year, literally one year before this, the government decided to close this school, and they, they decided to close like about 150 schools as a cost-cutting, you know, austerity, mm. like balance the budget type yeah. of approach. Um, is that a, only one year before they decided to close the school, Northland had been named in the report of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody yeah. as an example of a school that is exactly the sort of school that's needed um, so that Aboriginal children can have a, an education um, and hopefully not end up on the streets and in jail through racial profiling. So... Um, it's just, just the outrage that this school could then be closed literally a, a, um, yeah. a year later. And it's very, very present still through just in custody um, right up to the present day of how many recommendations of that report were never implemented. Um, should I play the video at this point? Well, yep, I think, if you, I think that'll give people a good idea of the level of yeah, community activism. That happened. Yeah, it's just three and a bit minutes. One of the schools putting up a fight is Northland Secondary. 
awaiting the arrival of Northland Secondary College, the school's Koori students and friends in traditional dress. The community is angry, the community is determined to fight, but we're also determined to show some of the unique things that we do at Northland. Northland has the highest number of Aboriginal students of any Victorian state school. And the teachers aren't just like teachers, they're all friends, it's like one big family. I want my son to be part of a bigger community, this community. Koori's can come here, walk with their heads up high, feel proud of what they are, not be hassled for that, and have sensitivity and respect accorded them. This is, that makes them far from anything else, that makes this place unique in Australia. What the government didn't count on was the school's point-blank refusal to die. For a year, rebel students worked on without government assistance. When the school was locked and guarded by roaming security officers, students went elsewhere. A bus, a church, the local park, even a football locker room became a classroom. Volunteer teachers scraped together an education for their tiny school with barely enough pens and paper to go round. Throughout, the state government hoped students would just enroll elsewhere. I really believe that the kids won't go anywhere else. I mean, it's already been proven from the other students who isn't going anywhere else. It's all written account accountable for six of our ex Northland students in the career wise There's only six of them going to school at the moment, out of 67. But, when they did, repeated appeals to the Supreme Court by the Kennett government finally failed. The Equal Opportunity Board's ruling that Koori students had been discriminated against with the school's closure will stand. Thanks for that, Claire. That's the first time I've seen it. So it really sums up the story well and brings back a lot of memories for me um, and a lot of emotions. So I think that really tells the story well. So I think now we've got Licho Lopez joining us. So I'd like to introduce Licho and she's going to maybe give a response or ask us some questions about this story from her perspective. Welcome, Licho. Thank you. Um, I should I should start by um, acknowledging that I am uh, sustained by the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and that I um, come to you from another stolen land at the shores of the Caribbean. Um, and I would like to thank Claire and, and, and everybody for the invitation uh, to be part of this and to learn a little bit more about um, the school. Um, how beautiful it is to see this number of images of resistance. Um, they are in many ways an enactment of multiple literacies. So it is in many ways an enactment of school and multiple literacies to resist the closing of schooling. Um, uh, which is absolutely beautiful and in many ways um, in itself an, an, an indigenous way of, of doing education in the streets. Um, 
I um, found interesting a couple of things. And so I'm going to offer those two thoughts and then um, a few questions. Um, so when the colonizers in the, in, in the so-called Americas um, and in so-called Colombia um, came to uh, get the kids to go to school, um, the parents um, used to hide them um, under anything that they found so that they wouldn't take the kids to school to be assimilated. Um, I, I think that there are uh, similar uh, experiences uh, in this place so-called Australia. Um, and, and it's interesting, it's an interesting contrast to see what is happening now with the young people claiming to keep school and to retain school and to go to school. Um, but uh, connecting to what, what um, Auntie Lynn was saying um, about the fact that Northland was more than a school, um, it, it is a different sense of understanding um, schooling when it is connected to community and when community is what makes um, the school. And so uh, through the presentation, I kept wondering what made Northland uh, a significant place um, for this struggle to, to take place. And, and, and part of that is the unschooling of schooling uh, that, that the school was trying to enact in that community foundation that, um, that it sustained um, and, it, and it maintained uh, even after that uh, two and a half year pause. Um, I have a few questions. And, uh, um, one of them is perhaps to get, um, that Claire started talking about this um, a bit, and that is the reasons why uh, the closing of the school happened and um, what sort of resonances do you see uh, in the present vis-a-vis um, -vis this relationship between government and schooling? So what kinds of things are we experiencing now in the 21st century that might be um, uh, self-similar, not necessarily exactly the same, but self-similar to what um, was happening in the school? And then uh, another question. So that one, it, it's basically um, related to um, the the oppressive uh, enactment of the school upon of the of the government upon the school, and then my second question is the other side of that. Um, what sort of resonances do you see um, in terms of the struggle that was fought uh, back then in the press, and what kinds of struggles do you see um, that might be taking place? in schools um, in, in, in this, the 21st century. And then finally, um, what can uh, people uh, here uh, and anyone really that will be able to participate in the multiple uh, formats that the project has to communicate uh, what it's been learning from this experience? What, what kinds of, of, of things can we learn from and what kinds of cues should we be listening to to uh, struggle in similar ways uh, in the present. So I'll just leave it there. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Lucho, for your thoughts. Claire, do you have a, I think she asked for your take on that. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Lee Cho. And just to join another dot is that um, Lee Cho um, had been searching out to, to find black thinkers in Australia and, and found Foley and Foley then um, said that, that um, our interests would co coincide around this project. So um, that's the background of Lee Cho being here as a, as I think I said, a sister researcher to an, an activist um, to the project. Um, and I guess, yeah, there's just so many similarities with uh, like, like those three points you just brought out, but like um, Book Book Willem comes to, comes to mind. So that's another, that's an early years um, space for children. Um, Book Book Willem means children's place. Um, it's an early years and family centre in Melbourne and it is just so, so excellent and so conceptualised and theorised in how it um, works with children and um, and yet it, it struggles all the time with the that with basically almost being about to run out of money and it's just it's just so hard to 
I just feel so naive because I'm always so surprised. Like what you were saying before, Lynn, that it sort of feels like a surprise, but it doesn't feel like a surprise. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did, yeah. Did you want to hop in, Lynn or Al, around the other points around resistance and that's happening now and... Um, and even like what Lisa, you said about how you resist now, like my learning from from Lynn around the struggle to just to, the struggle to be and do as Aboriginal people, that is a daily daily struggle it, within the project as well because I'm I'm of a different way. So yeah, I think resistance um, is a key word for me. <laughs> um, you know, I've always loved education, um, but I think in I've always been also mindful of, um, I mean, I'm very lucky to have been raised where my grandparents and great grandparents, um, a strong sense of culture and identity and who I am. Um, and um, I value and appreciate that so much. As a young woman, when I first came to Melbourne, I was 17 going on 18, I um came to went to melbourne for a summer holiday job at the weather bureau and um met up with jenny who uh, married we ended up married marrying brothers um the thorpe brothers um alice and bobby picked and, a good pair there hey? <laughs> picked a good pair of... yeah and um we initially met through a camp you know a camp in victoria um camp Dungai. but it's funny how i think sometimes people are destined um, to cross paths and um, but it was from that experience that we um, I ended up going and doing the Swinburne Community Organisations course with Bruce McGuinness um, and then Foley, um, John Morrison who's passed, passed now um, but um, and Foley, that's where I first met Foley um, he, he used to come there and um, teach some of those sessions but it was really my first awakening to um or awareness of black history i guess um mm. that i was protected from and um from that point on i've always had this strong sense of identity um and you know maintaining who my, who i am but with that added knowledge of history and the things that occurred i think that um was pretty life-changing for me and a lot of um young Aboriginal people um, who have gone on to become activists. I mean, we're all activists in different ways, I think. But that was a life-changing experience. And I think all those things, um, learning um, more about the um, Aboriginal history and um, working in education, you know, going on to work in education, um, there, there is, um, I always had a resistance not to become assimilated um, well, for as long as I can remember because my identity and knowing and i think it must have been really pumped into my head when i was little um because i always had this and my it was so important for my children um and that's one of the reasons why i didn't want my son to um oh, that's why i allowed him to um gave him the choice of you know he's only 13 um whether he wanted to go to the rebel school or did he want to go to a regular school i, I wanted him to have the choice and i thought he was he had that right um and you know when i was in in the courts i was um i think i was the last one to go on the deidre and i were the last people to go on the stand in the equal opportunity and i think um i, I was sort of um spoken of like i was a bad mum you know because i didn't do the right thing by my son allowing him to go um to um get a good education um rather than being at a rebel school you know and um where i got a better education where he got a life you know he got a life changing experience there right there um but you know like i think every day it's just made me realize and even as educators deidre and i say we we are the kids we're the kids too you know we're workers but we're actually the we're the kids and family we feel the same as they do you know we're we're community people and um you know so I think in some ways we were decolonizing um, that place um, back then, you know, 
there was no Captain Cooks with this Discovering Australia and all these different things. But um, you know, like it wasn't um it was it was a thing that just evolved and happened over time. Um and um there was a number of people, you know, Rafaela um Galati Brown, um she's still actually at the school, which is now a, a technology center, Rafaela, and quite a few of the teachers. And um, she was so staunch, you know, she stuck it right out from the start to the finish and she committed herself um, with that, you know, so she should be commended for that as well. Um, as other, all, you know, everyone who was involved, um, I think every part, you know, the two complainants, Gary, um, Gary's son, Bruce Foley and Muthama Sinopan, um, and all the families and kids who were there. I mean, as one, it's, it's important for us to achieve and, and um, feel like, you know, people that can contribute to society and, and have a, you know, good life, quality life and stuff. But uh, as a collective, I think that's the power in our strength as Aboriginal people. You know, instead of all these divisions, um, forever um, trying to divide Aboriginal people. And I think because we've experienced it for generations, I think I think really now is the time that we need to go the other way, honestly. Uh, we need to come together rather than allow those things to divide us. Because, you know, the end, at the end of the day, what we're fighting for is you know one thing that I always thought about is I don't want my future great 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 grandchildren reading about being Aboriginal in a book and no not knowing what that means, you know, not having a connection to country. Sorry, it's but that's how important it is because you know I just said to somebody just the other day you don't know what it's like. You, you, there's all, almost something every day that you've got to fight for in terms of your identity and you know something in the system there's al always something there that um is it's just draining you know like you just get so tired of it um mm. but this project is very up uplifting um you know there's a next generation um the big cabaret show uh at year and boy next year um, exhibitions but you know what it does though you know it's, it's appropriate that that it's done that way because that is really what our cultural our identity was all embedded and intertwined into that and that's how we developed and grew relationships with people um, you know make new knowledge Aboriginal ways of knowing doing being seen mm. those things are yeah. intertwined so and that's just just makes me think, Lynn, of how how much I've changed and learned my sense of what this even is. That it's not a project; it's not a project to tell a story from the past. It's actually, like you're saying, like creating new knowledge. Actually, it's a new chapter in everyone's lives, and it's actually just living and being and doing. It's not a, it's sort of not a project as such. Um, even though, of course, there are pressures around around it to you know produce something um but it's really i've i've learned a lot um you know history history is so important really if we don't know our history and who we are and where we come from we don't have any future to speak of we need to know you know our history is um critical for all people um and you can see what the result has been for aboriginal people not knowing our history and knowing who we are or being, you know, trying to get that um, any little piece of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones that I was I raised up around families. There's people who haven't had that. Um, anyway, I'll just, there, there needs to be more Northlands, um, different model of education. Um, and it doesn't have to be just in you know, secondary school, it can be in universities and that's where it should be too, in universities. Because uh, we're, you know, looking after land, country, people. Yeah. I'll leave yeah, it there. I think Start it's an ongoing me. struggle, isn't it? And if you, yeah. if you look around today, we haven't stopped fighting. We haven't stopped struggling. 
and it's just different ways of doing it now and and however we intersect with government i think that's yeah. always a potential for that you know tension so that was one space where we really fought hard and long to maintain how we wanted to do teaching you know how we wanted to educate kids and i think what you did mum was you and only Deidre and the school really protected kids to learn, to be able to learn in a safe way, culturally safe, but also in an inclusive way. So I think um, the school really educated a lot of people, not just the kids. No, yeah. Yep. Um, but the yeah. system probably still hasn't learnt. Well, I think that's the other point, is that no. how do we disrupt the system to make sure that these things aren't dismantled? Um, and, and to continue to decolonize because it, for a future in this country we have to learn how to live together and that means learning yeah. off each other and and you know australia's got a rich history a rich you know there's a aboriginal history here an ancient history the oldest history in the world and so that needs to be respected and understood by everybody and it starts at i think claire you, you brought a really good point it starts at kindergarten the kids have got to learn there and that means all kids have got to understand the history of this country and who's here and who who's connected to it and i think you know that my kids go to a primary school now where they're learning Wurrung, and that's starting to get embedded but it's it's tiny projects and i think it needs to be broadened and supported more mm. so you know it's a way that you know that education through 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 from primary all the way up to university, that's going to start changing the psyche of Australian people. That's the only way to do it. So it's going to take a long time. And this treaty exercise is a part of it. You know, it's all part of it. We have a couple of minutes left for this yeah. session, but there are um, some questions coming in. Um, one question, how might the project impact on current Aboriginal kids in schools? How? No. I think it's a good package, Claire. I think we need to encourage, you know, not just Aboriginal kids. You know, I think it's so important for our kids to know this story, but I think everybody could learn from this. And if we've got a theatre production or a documentary or whatever comes out of this project needs to be shared, you know, through different curriculums, you know, I think that's the best way that we could do it. And I think that'll be great. Claire, what do you think? Yep, yep, curriculum. Um, and there's even archives from um, how how identity and strength and power was taught at the school at Northland. We've got like archives from that, and yeah, I could I'd love it if um, like school plays could be done. Like if we're hoping that the cabaret will be developed into a full length stage show, kids could be doing musicals, you know, at their at their school, maybe. I don't know. But even just the Northland way of how um, the drama teachers would work with the students to write their own story and, you know. Mu through music, okay. dance. Yeah, you because know, creativity is um, is right really at the heart of uh, creation stories. Creativity, like, isn't just in art, visual arts. It's in everything. It's in science. You know, it's it's... I think that the layering of Aboriginal knowledge isn't just about dancing and telling, you know, like there's a deep knowledge um, that is connected to country and the land. And those knowledge systems go back 40,000 or more years. And, you know, when you think about it, those, we have the, the, our ancestors' bloodlines in our genes. And, you know, we want to keep that going and we want to keep it alive, but we want to share that. And we're very generous people, I believe. Mm. We're, you know, uh, Indigenous people all, all over the world really like, there's a lot of commonalities between Aboriginal people all over the world. Indigenous knowledge is a crucial today. Yeah. I think, especially, okay, especially yeah. relating to climate and environmental harms yeah. that we're doing at the moment. I think we need to, we need to start learning quick. But yeah. I think we don't have much time left. Roshani, do we have any so more No, we have about, um, a minute left or at 7.55 now, um, but you can just kind of wrap up if, if you'd like. Well, I think I will, I'll wrap up because otherwise we'll keep talking all night. Yeah. But I just want to thank all of our guests, our panel and everybody for coming tonight. 
uh, I really do encourage you to go out and hear, talk, you know, listen and hear Aboriginal people's stories and understand, you know, the struggle. Um, I think that's the only way you can learn. And there's plenty of them out there at the moment and work out how you can be an ally. Yeah. I think that's the best way forward for all of us. But um, thank you everyone for joining us and good night.